Sunday morning service. Everybody kind of got quiet, so that's a good sign, and it's time to get started. We're really appreciative of each of our visitors that are here uh, to be with us this morning. Uh, our desire here is just to worship God this morning, so let's all enter in. Let's give God a good service this morning. Appreciate each of our uh, ones that maybe are online, watching us online. We're really appreciative that you have joined us this morning as well. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to start with a word of prayer. If you're able, let, let us stand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to be in the house of God, to learn more about you, dear God, to, uh, to give praise and honor to your name, dear God. You've done so much for us. Lord, help us, uh, each one, just to enter in with our whole hearts, to have our cups up. Uh, help us to be attentive, to listen, to hear that still, small voice uh, that when it speaks to us this morning, we pray. Uh, thank for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This time we're going to have the choir start off with some songs. I'm 
My Savior died on Calvary. He bled and died for you and me. And since that day, that blood has never lost its power. Though mountains have been in my way, the clouds of gloom may hide the light of day. Still I'll go on and praise his name through the blood. Through the blood there's victory.
in spite of the storm. I've fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas. The anchor holds in spite. Amen. Thank God our anchor holds this morning. Amen. Amen. So let's stand. If you have a hymnal in front of you and you can't see the front here, we're going to start with, Oh, How I Love Jesus. It's number 261. <laughs> Hope your voices are warmed up. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect claim. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! How I love Jesus Because he first loved me It tells me what my Father hath In store for every day And though I tread a darksome path Yield sunshine all the way Because he first loved me, it tells of one whose loving heart can fill my deepest woe, who when he sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus because he first loved me. Amen. Amen. You can sit down. Second song is number 244. Faith is the victory. <clears throat> Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is a victory we we know that all comes the world. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love. 
Our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph drawn. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept over every land. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each hand with truth all gird about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, the glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall begin. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the host of night. In Jesus' conquering name, faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Amen. You still got victory? Did you overcome the world last week? A good sign that you're here. But if, you, if for some reason you get knocked down, the first thing you need to do is make sure you get right back up. I tell you, the, the enemy, he's, he's in it to get us. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're going to get knocked down, but the key is you got to get right back up. Don't stay down if you've been knocked down, persecuted, whatever the case may be. The key is you got to get right back up. We're, we're in this battle to win it. We've we go, we got to make it to the finish line. We don't want to stumble 100 meters, 100 yards before the finish line, but we got to make it the whole way, don't we? So I encourage you to keep pressing on. I have a verse uh, this week that was really good to me. It's uh, in Psalms, Psalms 19, uh, excuse me, 139, verse 14. It says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. And there was a quote uh, that someone wrote that goes with this verse I'd like to share. It says, uh, the, the discipline of celebration is the deliberate habit of engaging in actions like worship, praise, and thanksgiving with the purpose of declaring with energy appreciation of all God is and does. Have you noticed his marvelous works in your life? Have you, have you noticed the, this workmanship, how marvelous it is? You look outside the world, everything that he has created for us. Uh, just our bodies itself are just a wonder. I mean, scientists and docs have tried to figure out how to solve all of our issues, all of our needs, and they still haven't figured it out. I tell you, our God is so huge, so marvelous. His creation, it, it just baffles us. It baffles the world. So even the brightest people on our continent, it baffles them. And uh, so the question is, do you know it? Do you know the marvelous work that he has done? If you know the marvelous work that he has done, you will have praise on your heart for what he has done for you in your life, in your, in your body, in yourself, in your spirit. He has done a marvelous work in his heaven, hasn't he? And we want to praise his name this morning. We've got a couple of songs this morning. We're going to start off with uh, Sister Glenda. So Sister Glenda, if you could come and uh, bring your special for us this morning. Right after that, we'll have uh, you, Brother Dave Lacan.
This song is Ode to Joy, or we call it Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee in the hymnal. But I'm just so thankful for, like the brother said, the wonderful work that he has done. And um, I was reading this morning, and it talked about how he has delivered or saved us from the power of darkness and placed us in the kingdom of his dear son. And that's reason to be joyful and to rejoice in him. And I'm so thankful that I don't have to be part of darkness anymore, but I can be in God's kingdom. Such a beautiful place to be, and I'm so thankful. Appreciate your prayers. Well, good morning, saints. Isn't it good to be saved? Jesus said in this world, you're gonna, there's going to be tribulation. What does he want us to do? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The world's in big trouble. I haven't seen so much trouble since I was born. But thank God we have a hope in Jesus. That's the only hope we have. People's hopes are crumbling all around them. But our hope in heaven is secure. Thank God for salvation. Oftentimes we get discouraged and we think that no one cares. It's hard to find somebody just to sit down to talk and share about the things that God has promised and the things that we will see. In this song that I am singing, this is what he means to me. He's my lighthouse. He's my bridge over troubled water. He's the old ship of Zion out on the raging sea. He's my cornerstone. He's the one I'm leaning on. He's the man who conquered Calvary. He's the rock I'm standing on. Just remember when he saved us, when he took away our sins. He put a hope within us, gave us life that never ends. And delivered us from darkness, 
placed us in the church of God, wrote our names down in the Lamb's book, gave a home in heaven above. He's my lighthouse. He's my bridge over troubled water. He's the old ship of Zion out on the raging sea. He's my cornerstone. He's the one I'm leaning on. He's the man who conquered Calvary. He's the rock I'm standing on. Let us lift our hearts toward heaven and thank him for his love. He showed a new beginning on the wings of a dove. For he brought us through the dark nights and he's helped us through our sorrows. I'm excited in his spirit. I can sing about his love. He's my lighthouse. He's my bridge over troubled water. He's the old ship of Zion out on the raging sea. He's my cornerstone. He's the one I'm leaning on. He's the man who conquered Calvary. He's the man who walked on Galilee. He's the man who set my spirit free. He's the rock I'm standing on. Are you standing on that rock, Christ Jesus, this morning? I tell you, thank God we can be standing firm on that rock. If you're not on that rock, you can, you can find that rock this morning. I tell you, it, it's ready and it's available for, for everyone. It's, it was available to me, and I tell you, if it's available for me, it's available for everyone, because he is no respecter of persons. Very appreciate that. This time we're going to go to prayer. Uh, due to the space of time, we're just going to take requests by the upraised hand and spoken request this morning. Any unspoken requests this morning? Let's stand, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Carlos, could you lead us in prayer this morning, Brother Carlos? Our God and Father, we come before you this morning with gratitude and praise in our hearts, Lord. We're grateful uh, that we live in this country where we can have the freedom to worship and praise your name and we know that there are other places in this world that are going through much suffering at this time, Lord, and uh, we just pray that you'll have mercy, dear Lord, this morning, uh, dear Lord, but we're here, Lord, you know every uplifted hand uh, that went up this morning, you know uh, uh, each request, uh, Lord God, we bring them before you, dear Lord, and uh, we request, uh, Lord, this morning that you help our pastor as he brings forth the message that you have for us. Lord, you know each and every one of our needs, and uh, Lord, we pray that you help us to be honest with ourselves and that we may be able, be able to measure up to what you have for us this morning. Those that are here that are not saved, we pray that you speak to them in a clear way. Uh, those that are not able to be here because they're sick in their body, we pray that you'll touch in a special way. Dear Lord, uh, we leave everything in your hands this morning, dear Father, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This time we'd like to ask our pastor to come forward. Let's each one uh, be attentive. It's a very short period of time. Let's uh, get rid of any uh, distraction, distractions or any thoughts that might uh, take our mind away from this portion of the service. We want to get what God has for us this morning, don't we? All right, Brother Dave. Good morning. <clears throat> We're glad for each one of you that are here this morning. Wanted to take a little bit of time with the Word of God and we appreciate <clears throat> all the uh, encouragement that we can get coming to church. Amen? Amen. And uh, hopefully that by the time you leave this morning, today, uh, you've got a little bit extra in the tank. You can go out tomorrow and go forth conquering and to conquer. I think that's what the Bible says. Amen. If you're able, let's stand. I want you to turn to the book of Isaiah, <clears throat> chapter 1. I'm not going to read all these verses, but I'm going to reference them and read a couple for you, and then we'll have prayer and you can be seated. Okay. I would like to talk to you this morning about the reservoir of faith. <clears throat> if there was ever a time when God needed a reservoir of faith 
in the world today, it's now. <clears throat> the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. <clears throat> and then he talks about a sinful nation, and I'd like you to go down to verse 5, 6. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Verse 5 said, why should you be stricken any more? We will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. Verse 7, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire, your land strangers. Devour it in your presence. Is desolate, overthrown by strangers. These are hard words to read in any time, in any place. But this is in the Bible also. <clears throat> And then he talks about the daughter of Zion. But I'd like you to pay attention to verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. And I'm going to refer to the verses that follow, but let's just pause and have a word of prayer. Father, we ask you to again be with us in this portion of our service. We're thinking of uh, all the good things that you've done for us, but Lord, we want to be reminded of what you expect from us and how important it is in this day and time to pay attention to the reservoir of faith that God is meant to be in us and in the church. And so that's our purpose this morning is to ask ourselves, how full is our reservoir? It's necessary. Keep our minds centered on the word of God and let the spirit speak to the heart, we pray in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Thank you. We want <clears throat> to be a reservoir of faith. We need to be a reservoir of faith. Reservoirs and remnants are kind of the same thing in a way. Reservoirs, verse 9 talked about remnants. We want to talk about reservoirs and remnants. We'd like to talk about what fills them or empties them. And lastly, the value of being planted close by living water. Reservoirs, filling them, emptying them, being planted close by living water. <clears throat> I'm sure all of you have been pay paying attention to the news this past week and the terrible events <clears throat> in the Middle East. And there's still a war going on in Ukraine. You wouldn't know it, but it's still there. Just the public discourse and all the things going on and political seasons and that kind of thing. And somebody mentioned, <clears throat> in many of our lifetimes, we haven't seen this kind of trouble. Now, of course, if you lived in the 1930s and the 1940s, you saw it. If you lived in the 1910s, you saw it. Of course, none of you did. But in our generation, this is... This is uh, an unsettling season for the world. There's no question. And it reminded me of just how difficult it is to get up in the morning, go to work, and feel like you're safe, right? You read things and people making comments and statements, and it just feels like a very unsafe time, a very unsafe world. And it's a grieving time for many people. And so this message this morning is to meant to encourage you and also to remind you of the great value that you have if you have access 
to a heavenly reservoir, a heavenly fountain. The great value that you have in this world, it, it will bring what this world needs. And it will certainly help you feel safe in a time when it's a very unsafe world that we live in. So that's, that's our purpose this morning. It's important. This book that we're reading in Isaiah here begins about 150 years before Israel was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar and he exiled Israel to Babylon. And Isaiah is a prophet. And he's speaking during, during the time of these kings of Judah. He mentions them, uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. These are kings of Judah and it's some <clears throat> a century and a half before Israel is going to be exiled. But God has given him a message to Isaiah. He said, I want you to preach to my people because they're, they're waffling. They're, they're, they're being affected by the nations about them. They're not paying attention to what I've taught them. And they're in a very perilous moment in their history. And I want you to teach them how, how, how in sometimes angry I am with what's going on so that they might be saved. And God feels the same way in every age of time. If we know what he expects of us to live a prosperous life, a healthy life, God help us in this moment not, not to be careless and make up our own stories about how we should live life and what God expects of us. Because God needs us to pay attention to what he's telling us so that we too can be safe and we can be a place of safety, a reservoir, right? He meant for Israel to be a reservoir of faith to the nations that surrounded Israel. But in this moment, Israel was finding itself being unfaithful. And their, their reservoir was drying up. But in verse 9, he said, except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant. Or even just a pond, a, a, a portion of water. Unless the Lord had left us a very small remnant, guess what? We should have been just like Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, we would have been destroyed but for the very small reservoir of faith that God left among us. Now, each of us is meant to be that reservoir of faith and that remnant in a world which has completely lost its mind and decided that it doesn't need God and is therefore now suffering as much as Sodom and Gomorrah had suffered, when the remnant is not present in us. Because we think of a remnant as being a, a collection of people, but the remnant begins in each of us. A remnant or reservoir is in, must be in us. Before we can ever be a remnant as a body, as a light or an example to our community. It needs to be in us. So the message this morning is meant to ask you to consider, <clears throat> do you yet have a remnant inside of you? Do you have a reservoir? And you might say, brother, I, I love Jesus. I'm a faithful Christian and all of that. Well, let's take a look at where we live. Not what we profess, but where we live. All right? Those are meant to be the same thing. Where you profess that you live and where you actually live are meant to be the same place. We can't profess to love God and be a Christian and then go out and behave as, as the spirit of the world is behaving today. We can't do that. That's hypocritical. And there's no remnant. There's no reservoir that's being shown there when we have one profession but another way of living. So we're talking about a remnant which is a reservoir this morning. 150 years before Nebuchadnezzar defeats these people, the prophet is getting this message. 
And the message goes on for another 50 years. This is just the beginning. If you read the entire book of Isaiah, he mentions a progression of leaders of Israel during which time he's, he's prophesying. This message in Isaiah is going on for a good 50 years. And the people still don't get it. Because by the end of the story, they're carried away into exile. But thank God, even if you find yourself exiled from God this morning, his desire, the reason why he's sending this message through Isaiah is the same reason he's sending it to us this morning. Even if you find yourself exiled, God will search after you because his desire is to bring you back into the remnant. You might say, well, I don't have faith this morning to be in the reservoir that you're speaking of. But that's God's desire. Find yourself in this reservoir. If you're exiled this morning, we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be exiled. Find your way back because God is, is bringing this prophecy to you also. Come on back. Come on back to this reservoir. Because guess what? The world, <clears throat> otherwise, <clears throat> either we're in this reservoir of faith or we're out in the exile of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that is the spirit that is beyond this reservoir. There is no happy middle ground. There's no place of safety beyond this reservoir at its shores being fed by its living water. There's no place of safety. If that's not evident to you, then don't read the news tomorrow morning. Don't wake up and read the news and expect to find a place of safety anywhere but this reservoir. I, I, I want to draw a stark comparison between the two. A place of safety and a place beyond it. And look at verse 9. I mean, you, you decide for yourself. Except the Lord of hosts had left us a very small remnant, we should have been just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Can you see another place where people can live? Either Sodom and Gomorrah or a remnant. There's not a middle ground. There's not some other place you can construct. You come to church, you listen to the message, you say, I want to believe in Jesus because that's what it takes to go to heaven. But then when I go out, I, I mingle in that spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, and I still feel safe. We're fooling ourselves if we think there's a middle ground that's safe. A reservoir of faith. He lived in a very fragile world. Isaiah did. They had strong enemies in the south. They had strong enemies in the east. They had strong enemies in the north. It's just like the, the situation today. It's no different. It hasn't changed. And the world we live in is very similar. Surrounded by strong spiritual enemies. These people had forsaken God. What did he say in verse 5? Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. Look how he describes it. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and nothing is healing. And no ointment can bind it up. Your country is desolate. That's a pretty bleak picture, isn't it? I don't think God would have much different to say about the world that we live in today. Really. And so he's trying to encourage them, ironically, by exposing the unsoundness <clears throat> of trying to find yourself getting along in the unsoundness of the world when he says, I have a place of refuge for you. Won't you come back to my place of refuge? And don't, don't play the middle ground. Verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? See, we can't sacrifice with our lips, but our heart is far from him. Not going to work. 
I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, of the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of goats. And when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Don't bring your vain oblations, incense and abominations unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assembly, I can't stand it. It's iniquity. Verse 14, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hated. They are troubling. You know what? When we follow a pattern of religion or tradition or rituals, right? Even if our lips say, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, right? Even if we do that. But if in reality our heart is far from him, God says, I can't stand that. I wish you would not even profess. I, I, I wish you would take your sign down. Then I can deal with you. Now look, I ask you a question. Is he speaking to Israel? Okay, so he's not speaking to the Gentile nations around Israel. He's speaking to Israel. Now, we this morning, we are Israel if we profess to love God. Okay, so this message is for us. He's speaking to us. And he's saying, if your heart in reality is far from me. Now, I know I, I, I'm trying to very hard by the help of God to draw this distinction. I know that you say you love God. I know that's true. And I believe in one sense, all of us believe that. None of us would knowingly say, I love God, then go live like the devil. None of us would knowingly do that. But now there's another, another thing going on today. I love God, but in my heart, I'm troubled. I'm discontent. I am, I'm not happy. And then what follows that? There are cousins that follow those feelings. I begin to be discouraged. The next cousin that shows up in that family is I start to find fault, fault finding. Down the road, if we're not careful and we don't really, really do business with this, we start to get bitter. Bitterness works its way in and bitterness and fault finding and bitterness. I want to tell you something. When these people were exiled from the place that God had designed for them, which was Jerusalem. When they were exiled, they hung their harps upon the willow in Babylon because they could not sing the songs of Zion. And when we become exiled from the presence of God by, by all of this stuff, you know, discontentment, unhappiness, discouragement, leading to despair and bitterness. When we become exiled from the presence of God, you know what the enemy wants to tell you? You can still serve God. You can still love God. You can take your, it's sort of a portable Christianity. You can take it anywhere. It'll all be good. They require too much. God requires, he, God, God doesn't require what they say that he does. And then what happens is people take this and they think they can still play the same song of Zion elsewhere. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily within these four walls, but you understand what I'm saying. People take their harps. Your harp is a symbol of your experience with God. It plays a certain song. It plays a song of deliverance for one. It also plays a song of holiness. Holy is God. It plays a song of thanksgiving. It plays a song of dedication. It plays a song of unity with the saints. That's what this harp plays. See, but the enemy will come to us and he'll say, you know what, you can take this harp anywhere. You can play this harp anywhere. That's a lie of the devil. What I have seen is when people get into a situation where 
They, they, they start to lose. Their, their oblations are vain. And a person says, oblation is an offering. And, 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 they, and they say, oh no, my oblation is not vain. My oblation is, is holy. But God says, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. These are the symbols of their worship. And God said, don't bring those things anymore. Because your heart's not here. Your heart's not in it. You're going through a form. Repent of the form. Repent of, of the ritual. Because guess what? That is not what he wants. He wants our heart. But what happens is people, they take the form and they presume that the form is the same as obedience. They take the form, but I've never seen a person prosper that takes these oblations and this incense and assemblies and solemn meetings and new moons and appointed feet. I've never seen a person prosper who thinks that that's what God really wants. And they go out and what happens is they join themselves to this spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's actually what happens. Because there are no middle grounds. We are either in his vineyard, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, or we are in a Sodom and Gomorrah place. And guess what? There is worship going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what you can read from this chapter. It looks like Christianity. It looks like incense. It looks like sacrifice. But it's in, in a Sodom and Gomorrah situation. There is worship going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And this should stir us because guess what? When... If we were to find ourselves in that predicament where we're actually moving toward a Sodom and Gomorrah rather than this remnant, our reservoir starts to dry up. And that's really where we want to spend a little bit of time. Now that we know that this is serious business, verse 15, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes with you, from you, Yes, when you make your prayers, I will, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And so he says in verse 16, therefore, wash you. This is the remedy. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. And then what he says, cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless, plead the widow, or excuse me, plead for the widow. In other words, this is the remnant. This is what will fill your reservoir again. But the form without your heart is going to empty it. And so the question for all of us this morning is, where are we? Because God needs a remnant and a reservoir of faith in a very unsafe world today, more than ever, that we don't get swept up in fear, and it's a fearful world, don't get swept up in unsafety, if I can say that, but be a reservoir. A reservoir is like a remnant, it holds life. For those of us that remember and you've been there, not too far from here, Folsom Lake. Folsom Lake can hold up to 977,000 acre feet of water. It's a big reservoir. It's, it was built for flood control, but it does other things, right, that benefit us. You can take a boat out, there's fish in it, um, and probably most of all lately, it provides water for a couple hundred thousand people downstream. So this reservoir that's near us that can hold a lot of water is really important. There's a lot of benefit that comes from a reservoir. Now you remember during our drought, 
which they say we're still in, but a couple years ago, and the lake was dry. If you drove around the lake, all you could see was a little, a little stream meandering through the center of it to the dam. And a little bit of water just running through that, running through the dam, coming out. Most of the fish died in the lake. They say that there were some skeletons that they found that somehow ended up in the lake and nobody knew about from long ago. There were all sorts of artifacts that they found after the water left the lake. I mean, I went up there and looked at the lake and, and you could see the rocky bottom of the dam, of the lake. That's a sad thing when a reservoir that's supposed to hold water doesn't have any water. No boats float in it, no fish come out of it, reduced to a stream. The water districts that depend on the water from that lake, <clears throat> they had this water district that we're in right here, it has two wells, surface wells. When you're not allowed to pull water from the river, the only place we get our water is from the surface wells. They go down into the aquifer. Somewhere there needs to be a reservoir or we don't survive. Further downstream, they also had trouble. There's a water district on the other side of the American River. <clears throat> they don't have access to the surface wells like Carmichael does. They were buying water from Carmichael. I don't know how they got their water. I mean, water is the new gold in the West, right? It, 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 it makes things live. We're going to talk about that. So reservoirs are really important. We are meant to be a reservoir. And we're meant to be full enough that we can feed downstream what needs it. And if it goes dry, if we go dry, the benefits that we normally provide are gone. Not only that, each of us as a reservoir is meant to add to a bigger reservoir, right? Which is the church. And the church in a very unsafe world is so essential. When it's full, it's healthy. When it's low, it's sick. Isaiah 12, in verse 3, he also talks about the water. <clears throat> Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation or out of your reservoir, you're meant to take your cup of joy. Oh, not, I, I, I see this is so important. If you lose your joy, you lose your cup. And people lose their joy when discontentment starts to, to work. And it overwhelms the joy, and they can't pull out of that well when we become discontent. He's talking to his people, the importance of a, a place of water. What fills our reservoir is faith. And so I asked myself, how full is my reservoir this morning? Is my faith filling it up? Or is my faith weak and my reservoir is dropping? to the point that the only thing left is a little stream just running out. Now that's, that's a very weak place. And our faith will either fill it up or it'll dry it up. So we want to talk about that. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. I, I, I looked at the news this week and I thought, we need to remind ourselves that we are meant to be the reservoir of faith in an uncertain world. Take it very seriously. What empties your reservoir of faith is your flesh. There are many things that you could point to, but it boils down to, to our, our desires, our will, which the Bible calls your flesh. Your flesh empties your reservoir. For if you live after the flesh, you shall not, or excuse me, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Now again, the enemy is very clever, and he wants to tell a Christian that your decisions are never fleshly. 
They make sense, they're logical, they're rational. The alternative is not logical, it's not making sense, and it's irrational. The enemy wants to tell us that's the way we think. And so the decisions that we make, this is how the story goes, the decisions that we make, they're never fleshly. I would never knowingly back up on Christ. Well then, why do people backslide? Why do, people, why do people's reservoirs go dry? Good people. People that love God. People that want to make heaven their home. And their reservoirs are going dry. Why does this happen? If we say that I would never knowingly back up on God. The answer is our thinking becomes fleshly. Mark it down. This is not my opinion. This is what Word of God says. Either accept it or reject it. What empties the reservoir is fleshly thinking. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. If you lived after the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, you'll live. In other words, don't allow your mind to control your de decisions without first subjecting it to the will of God. Simple. Be humble enough to su subject your opinion to the will of God, and then you won't walk after the flesh. You won't walk after the flesh. Okay? Walking after the flesh will empty a spiritual reservoir. It dries up the spirit. Galatians chapter 5. You say, brother, what, what are the works of the flesh? We'll read them to you. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. I said this morning, let's find ourselves in a reservoir of faith. Not here. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. There are these. Adultery. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Those four things are sexual sins. Today, the world has no judgment and no discernment about behavior that used to be acceptable. I mean, people are behaving crazy. And it's on a treadmill going faster and faster. The first thing that he calls walking after the flesh are sexual sins. We cannot say that our reservoir is filling of faith if we are at the same time walking after the flesh. And if a person is allowing themselves these kinds of things, it's emptying your reservoir. We can't have it both ways. Works of the flesh. Idolatry. Idolatry is placing anything before God that we worship more than Him. That's idolatry. Most of the time, the greatest idol that we all do business with is our own opinion. We place our opinion on such a place that we say, don't touch my opinion. Are you, are you willing to allow God to touch your opinion? These are works of the flesh. Opinion. Idolatry. Witchcraft. The world today is dabbling <clears throat> with things that are antichrist. People are watching things that are sealing in your mind a kind of carelessness towards things that are evil. This is Sunday morning, and I normally don't deal with this kind of stuff, but there is no reason on earth why a Christian needs to put themselves down in front of something that's a television series about vampires. 
There's no reason on earth. A melodrama about vampires. Now see, it's kind of humorous in a way, but, but look, if it's that humorous, we have come to a place today where it's humorous. We've, we've, we've lost the ability to see how serious some things are. Witchcraft, making light. There used to be a comic strip <clears throat> and, the, and the fellow would write comics about how humorous the devil was and, and hell and poking fun of it and so forth. The world today makes fun of hell and Satan. Thinks it's a big joke. That's a work of the flesh. If our mind has gone there, our reservoir is going down. And I'm not being prudish. I'm not being overly cautious. There are some things that we, we just need to understand how life really works. Because you know what? I think sometimes people feel like there are no spirits in the world. That there's no spiritual battle going on anywhere. It's all opinion. I don't think so. Hatred. These are works of the flesh. Variance. Emulations. These are old-fashioned words. You can look them up. Wrath, strife, seditions, heresy, envying, murders, drunkenness. These are works of the flesh. Folks that used to say they love God, now, we go, now going down the aisle, <clears throat> buying alcohol, and opening the bottle on a Friday night with their family that used to didn't partake of this, and by the time the evening is over, everybody's a little tipsy, and then sometimes they're even pretty drunk. People that used to say they love God. I mean, why make an excuse for that? That's emptying the reservoir. You can't have it both ways. Come on. Revelings, such like... Of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, that they which do some things, these things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's not my opinion. That's what he says. So either we follow the book, we are followers of Christ, or we're on some other rock. Ah, but he says there's the fruit of the Spirit that fills the reservoir. What fills the reservoir, now let's ask ourselves, is this how I'm made up today? Joy. Love fills the reservoir. This is what the world lacks today. This is what the Sodom and Gomorrah today lacks, is this. And that's why the reservoir is empty. That's why this needs to be in our reservoir. Okay? Peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, meekness. Now, I understand we all go through rough spots in life. <clears throat> it's not always easy. I get that. Sometimes we don't feel right. I get that, too. Sometimes we're upset. I get that, too. I think God does, too. But what happens if somebody has to walk around eggshells around you? Because you're so unhappy. I, 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 I get it, I get it. I, you know me, I'm with you. We're here in this together, okay? But what we're talking about is Walking after the flesh or walking after the spirit? Is your reservoir being filled or is it being empty? Now, again, if we profess to love Jesus, we have to do business with this. Meekness. Temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live after the Spirit, let's also walk after the Spirit. 
I'd like to share with you my take on crucifying the flesh lately. Crucifixion begins with a choice. It's the choice to go to the cross for a Christian. If you have to get dragged to the cross, then your heart's not in it. But if we choose to go to the cross, what that means is I, I want to become so aware of who I am in this moment and, and how I'm affecting other people. And I, wa I, I want my reservoir to stay full in this moment. I am needy and people need me. I need my reservoir to stay full. In order for that to happen as a Christian, I have to choose to crucify the flesh. To choose to crucify the flesh at this moment means I need to become ultimately aware of my motive, what, you know, what's moving me. I need to see myself as God sees me. I, I, I need to allow other people to be right. Quit trying to make everybody else wrong. Let them be right. Now, how is that going to change the way you think and your attitude if you let them be right? Forget about for the moment that they might be wrong. Let them be right. Jesus placed himself in a moment when other people were wrong, but he let them do it. Let them be right. Now, you'll be able to see their point of view much clearer if you allow them to be right. Quit. We, we don't need to be so defensive. You know. I mean, we walk, even with our family, we walk around like this. And after our family, everyone that loves us, our, our friends, our neighbors, everyone's walking around on eggshells around us. And there's so much in this. We, we could, there, this. This goes so many different places. We are fearful. We're in pain. Sometimes we've been attacked incessantly. All of that. Choose to go to the cross. Choose to take all of that to the cross. If you say Jesus is your Savior, let him be your Savior. This is where Jesus gets down to where we live and where we get down to where he is. If you say he's your savior, let him be your savior. Amen. Don't defend and blame. Defend and blame never solved anything. As soon as you find yourself defending and blaming, that's the work of a flesh. The cross doesn't allow it. I'm trying to help us. To help our reservoirs get fuller. Okay? That's what we're trying to do here. Fruit of the Spirit. That's what fills us. Walking after the Spirit, not after the flesh. The Spirit. The Spirit is kind. It's gentle. It's just. It's joyful. It's all these things. When we find ourselves trying to empty somebody else, it's the work of the flesh. All right. Now the last thing is being planted by the rivers of water. Ezekiel chapter 47. And this is where we're going to finish. Ezekiel 47. I want to just share just one verse here. Verse 9. About what it's like when your reservoir is full. I want your reservoir to be full. I want my reservoir to be full. I want my reservoir to be at capacity. You ever seen Folsom Lake when it's at capacity in the winter? And they've got all the floodgates open and the water is pouring out. You ever seen that? It's impressive. There's a lot coming out. Amen. Verse 9. And it shall come to pass. 
that everything that lives, everything that moves, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. There shall be a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come thither. Look, look, look at what happens when the reservoir is full. They shall be healed. The waters heal themselves and then they heal others. Everything, everything shall live whither the river cometh. When a reservoir is full, it heals people. In your family, when your reservoir is full, it will heal people. In your family, when others' reservoirs are full, it will heal people. When reservoirs are dry, they suck. They don't provide. They take. They don't give. When reservoirs are dry. And I get it. This is complicated. This is not meant to be condemning. There are reasons why reservoirs go dry. I get it. My reservoir has gone down at times. My reservoir has felt dry in times past. Can I, can I be like you? If you're here this morning and your reservoir feels a little dry, I felt that way. I took responsibility. I said, I'll, I, I want it to be filled again. And I prayed and I said, God, what else, what's going wrong? Help this reservoir to be full again. Sometimes only you know the level of your reservoir. The waters that he's speaking of, they don't come. Listen to this. What fills our reservoir of faith does not come from social media. That's not where the waters come from. What fills our reservoir does not come from our opinion. What fills our reservoir does not come from a university. Some of these things may be helpful, but that's not where these waters come from. It doesn't come from any human source at all. Verse 1. He brought me again to the door of the house. And behold, water issued out from under the threshold of the house. What is the house? The house is the temple. The door of the temple is a heavenly place. What fills our reservoir comes from heaven. That's where the water comes from. It doesn't come from any man-made source. It doesn't come from opinion. It doesn't come from uh, 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 other experts or other... Look at anything... Of all the terrible things that are happening in the world today, look to heaven. In all of the trials and tribulations that you're going through, look to heaven. That's where the water comes from that's going to fill your reservoir. That is what fills the reservoir of faith. And these waters, they heal. Do you believe it? Do you believe the waters from heaven heal? And so we can ask ourselves, is my reservoir full or is it a bit dry? Have works of the flesh emptied my reservoir or am I allowing the works of the Spirit to fill it? We might need to pray this morning. Let's stand. We'll sing a song and be dismissed. While we're singing this song, ask yourself, please don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger. <laughs> I'm just the messenger. Don't get mad at me. I, I, I'm like you. I, 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 I suffer these things also, but I, I believe this. We've got, we've got to find the door of the house and let that fill us as we sing this song. for the 
strength you give to simply carry on through life's toils and tests the worst and best i'm never left alone you're always right beside me you hear me when i pray since i first began you've been my dearest friend and i give you all the praise thanks thanks i give you give you thanks this moment and i will continually for each day i live your grace you give i'm blessed abundantly i can't forget that moment when in my life you made such a change since the spirit came i've not been the same i just want to give you thanks thanks for a roof above and plenty of food to eat for life and breath my health and strength i'm blessed abundantly i'll never forget your goodness and all you've done for me i owe my life to you dear lord and i give you all the things thanks thanks i give you bad times when everything's going wrong and even on the mountaintop his love and presence makes me strong each and every moment of each and every day i'm gonna sing and shout don't let the rocks cry out i give you all the praise thanks thanks i give you at rest.